when I was thinking about what I wanted my life to look like over the next number of years, I wanted to be as close to the water as I could. So a float home became a, you know, a really viable option for me. I sail actively and have a boat in the marina here. It's also just gorgeous in the morning, getting up and having a coffee and looking out. Um, we have ducks that come and visit us. Folks are paddling by and, and it was just a, an appealing lifestyle that um, I felt I could make work. It's um, completely independent from the grid, so, so aside from being tied to the dock, it's, it's independent from power and, and sewer and water. I designed and built the, the entire float home. The only contractors I brought in were the electricians and gas fitters, so I built everything. I started thinking about it four years ago. I spent a year planning, looking into the feasibility of it. And then I started building it three years ago, just in my spare time, around work and life and everything else. So I chip away at it in evenings and weekends when I can, and uh, it's still a work in progress. I started by building a barge. So the barge is 16 feet wide, 40 feet long, and three feet deep. And I built it from four independent watertight boxes, basically that were all framed up out of uh, locally harvested cedar and then sheathed in plywood and then finished off with four layers of really heavy woven roving and chop strand mat fiberglass and then coated in epoxy. So it provides a, a real robust, strong platform for me to, to build upon. And uh, that's all decked over and sealed up. And then I just uh, started framing up and building the house on top of that. Uh, the house itself is 14 feet wide by 34 feet long on the main floor and then 12 feet by 24 on the second floor. So there's about 700 square feet of heated living space and then there's some storage down inside the hull. So when you walk in, you're in the main living area, which uh, there's a sofa here and kitchen and then I have a bathroom over here with the shower vanity and composting toilet. It's unfinished at the moment but it's it's in progress and then there's two good sized bedrooms upstairs. They're I think about 13 by 14 each so good sized bedrooms upstairs. There's no deck access upstairs. I didn't want to put a door in because of often in the winters we get quite a bit of wind and a door is just another place for air to be leaking through. So we access the upper deck from out on the foredeck out of the front door here. And then there's full 360 degree access upstairs from there. Ultimately there will not be a ladder here. It will be an alternating step space saving set of stairs um, built out of fur. Down under the sofa here is a sealed off battery bank and there's 740 amp hours of batteries and they're powered by, currently I've got 400 watts of solar panels up on the roof and we'll be expanding upon that as, as time goes by. It's not wired with household wiring, it's wired as a yacht or boat wiring which is um, multi-stranded, tinned against corrosion, wiring that you would find uh, in, in boats that wasn't a requirement, but it was something that I knew would help me get insurance and, um, and being able to have it fully insured was definitely a, a high priority with the project. My primary source of heat is a pellet stove. The pellet stove has a hopper in the back of it. So that holds a full bag, so about 50 pounds of pellets and that will last me about a week. I put a ton, so 2,000 pounds of pellets, they come in 50 pound bags down in the hull. And I went through 14 bags last winter, so it's pretty efficient. I have almost two winters worth of heat left on board here. The amount of waste is, is so minimal. It, it might be, you know, a quarter cup of ash after a week of, of use. You can get these so they're, they're set to thermostats. Mine is, is the simplest that you can get where there's just, you can set the settings right there and you can turn it on high or low. So there's access right there and there's, there's some pellets. And then I do have a secondary uh, propane bulkhead furnace that uh, is, is used as a backup source of heat. 
So outside in a locker, I have two 60 pound propane tanks. Um, so they heat the furnace. I'll be mounting this here. I'm just, uh, I have these frames here where I'm going to be tiling behind the furnace and the pellet stove. So the, the LP system feeds the furnace and then a small range that um, came from an RV. And then I also have gas lights, one down here and one in each of the bedrooms, which are there more as just a convenience if I come back on after a weekend and it's a little cool in here, we can turn those on and they, they warm things up pretty quickly as well. Last year, I think I spent about $700 on propane and pellets. And I ended up with two thirds of the pellets left over. So my heating costs through the year are, are pretty minimal. Um, on a monthly basis. For safety, um, each room has carbon monoxide detectors and then down in the hull I have explosive gas detectors as well for propane because propane's heavier than air and if it's going to leak anywhere it will leak down into the hull. I've got a halon system so there's a seven pound canister right here so if this reaches 135 degrees Fahrenheit it it will extinguish flames within a 16 foot radius so all my heating appliances are, are quite close to that Part of the reason that I wanted to live down here was, you know, I'm able to walk to most of the services and shops and stores in town, but it's a long walk, which is fine when the weather is like it is now, but in November and rain's coming sideways and that, you know, it, it's, uh, you just have to be ready for it. It's the mindset that you have. Um, it's okay. I don't mind it. The challenges are everything that I consume, I have to carry down here and I have to carry away. So it, it really forces you to monitor or be aware of what you're consuming. I don't have a garbage pickup that comes to the end of the driveway and takes everything away and makes it disappear. Anything that I use for heat, whether it's the pellets or propane, I have to go get it and I have to bring it back down here. So it just forces an awareness of consumption. The float home was insulated with spray foam. Spray foam was the most expensive and I was hesitant about it, but I, I ended up going with that and I'm really glad that I did. It provides the vapor barrier. And since I'm out here at the end of the dock and in the winter, we get quite a bit of wind. It really keeps the house nice and tight. I've got about R30 in the walls, R40 in the ceilings. But in addition to that, it locks the whole structure together. So when I am rocking around, there's no racking or twisting or creaking. The whole home does move, but it moves all as one unit. So for my water and utility systems, I pull water from the lake. Um, I checked with the province about getting a water license and, and because it's not land-based, it's, it's not required. So I pull water from about 25 feet down and I'm, I'm fairly far out into the lake here where there's a lot of current going by. We're, we're basically a river and, and there's a huge volume of water going by. So the water gets pulled in, it, it gets um, strained at its entry point and then goes through sediment filter. From there, it also feeds a five stage reverse osmosis water filtration system that feeds the water for drinking and, and cooking and that. There's nothing dumped overboard on the float home. My gray water system is self-contained. It goes through a series of filtrations, which is then pumped up to the flower boxes and, and evaporation takes care of it from that point. There's a grease trap under the kitchen that collects any, any grease or food waste that goes down the sink. From there, it goes into a 50 pound container that has screened and cleaned wood chips in it, maple wood chips. And a microbial community is set up there that provides initial treatment. From there, the gray water flows into another 50 pounds of activated charcoal. And from the activated charcoal, it flows into a sump, which pumps up all the gray water from that point that's been treated into 
piping that's in the softening, which then comes down and feeds the planter boxes and hanging baskets and window baskets that have all the flowers in. So the, the mulch and the soil and the flowers provide the final treatment and then evaporation takes it from there. 40 gallons a day, that's the maximum that I'd possibly be able to process with the flowers at the heat of summertime. For the winter time, when things are too cold for evaporation to be working, so I take waste heat from the pellet stove to evaporate my gray water into water vapor. We have a loop that cycles through the burn box and the pellet stove, which then goes uh, into a sump that the gray water is pumped into and is heated and evaporated off in that way. And then for black waste, I have a composting toilet, which has been up and running for about a year now and is working quite successfully. So my motivation for building it, I had a house about 20 minutes outside of town which was wonderful when my kids were younger, living out in the forest, but as they got older and their activities in town forced us to be going back and forth a, a lot more, it was becoming more of a challenge. And then as a single parent, it was just a lot, taking care of a house, a yard, plowing, shoveling, mowing. And I just was feeling like the house was owning me. I wasn't owning the house. I just felt like it was limiting the lifestyle that I wanted to have and the expense of it was was overwhelming. So the one thing that I felt that I could choose to do was was find a way to reduce my housing costs. And I thought about living aboard a boat, but with a couple of kids that were heading into the teen years, that didn't seem really practical. And I was in Vancouver walking docks and I saw some float homes and I thought, wow, I, I can do that. So that's what got me started thinking about the project. One was to reduce my housing expenses. And I knew that if I built it myself, I could keep the cost down. I figured I could build it in a way that used as much local materials as I could find. I also felt that I wanted to get a lifestyle that reduced my footprint and set that example for my kids. I wanted to show them that it was possible to have a really great quality of life, but not perhaps in a traditional way. And, and this was what I settled upon. Please share this video if you liked it. Also, be sure to subscribe to Exploring Alternatives and check out our playlists for more stories like this. Thanks for watching.